Hello, everybody. You're all very welcome. Um, first of all, I'd just like to thank everyone at the Michael Hill Competition for inviting me to speak here today. It's, uh, it's a pleasure and an honour. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, some of you might be aware, some of you might have noticed that this is sort of my second performance here this weekend. I gave an impromptu performance yesterday that uh, hopefully uh, won't be repeated. Um, so I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about, about bows. And I'll tell you a, a very little bit about the, the history. I'll talk to you a bit about the materials used in the bows. And I'll describe a little bit, uh, I'll describe a summary of the process of making a bow. And if we won't really have a lot of time probably for questions and answers, which I like to do, but you can always accost me around here over the weekend. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. So with, in, in terms of history, um, until the end of the 1700s, for centuries before that, the bow went through all sorts of changes, quite radical changes. So it, it went from having a, a convex camber to becoming something quite straight. It evolved and evolved until we ended up with the camber you see, more, more or less the camber you see today. It's, uh, it's concave. And by the time we get to the end of the 1700s, we meet a guy called Francois Xavier Tort, a bowmaker in Paris. And he's pretty much the father of modern bowmaking, really. And he was the guy who brought the, the bow to pretty much the fullness of its evolution. So he standardized a lot of things, like the, the length of the bow, the height of the frog, the height of the head, many of the dimensions, um, things like this little silver ferrule, on the front of the frog with a, with a wedge to hold the hair in a flat ribbon. Um, a lot of things like this tort uh, finalized. And since that time, the bow has hardly changed at all, very little. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's a very brief uh, part of history of the history of the bow. In terms of materials, I'll put one of these bows down somewhere. In terms of materials, one of the most significant things, obviously, is the, the wood that's in the, the stick. And that, too, changed a lot over the, over the centuries, until we get to the mid-1700s, and Pernambuco is discovered. And Pernambuco was being brought into Europe from Brazil. And it was discovered to be a very interesting wood for bow making. It was brought into Europe, actually, as a dye material. You can get a whole range of red colors from this, and even a, a tiny little shaving of this in a glass of water will turn it, the water pink very quickly. So it was being brought in in large quantity from Brazil. I guess bow makers spotted it, thought this must be worth a try, tried it, and by the end of the 1700s, again when we get to Francois Xavier Tort, it has become absolutely the, the wood of choice. And I find it extraordinary that all this time later, Still, nothing else has been found to equal or improve on Pernambuco. It, it, it really is the best material for the job. And that's to do with it's uh, a combination of strength, flexibility, sheer beauty, um, its ability to be bent into a shape and then to hold that shape really well. If that shape changes a little over, over time, as it can do, a bow can bend, it can, it can twist, it can lose some of this camber. All that sort of stuff can be, can be addressed and rectified. So potentially, if a bow is well looked after, it can last, uh, it can last uh, practically indefinitely, so long as it's well looked after. And all, any little problems that arise in the stick can be, can be fixed. So it really is quite an extraordinary timber. Um, the other wood that we see in the bow is ebony. Uh, that can come from India, Africa, Madagascar, Vietnam, Cambodia. The ebony that I use comes from the Vietnam-Cambodian border. That's another wonderful material, really. It's, uh, it's very hard wearing, it softens very nicely, but it's, um, it, it wears very well over the years. Uh, so you'll, you'll see bows in use today from, that were made in, by the likes of Francois Xavier Tort, and they're, they're still in very good health, even, even today. And then we have other materials such as, we have a lot of metal, 
we have in this bow we have we have silver. It could be gold, a gold-mounted bow. Usually, it's usually it's silver. We have um, at the base of the frog. You'll usually see some shell and shell eyes on the on the sides of the frog at the end of the button. That shell comes from various places. I use an abalone shell related to the power shell that we see in New Zealand. The abalone that I use comes from Japan. Other materials are things like, there's usually a, some leather here to protect the stick from, from uh, wear from the thumb. In my case, that's, I use, tend to use lizard skin. It comes from Mali and Chad. Then you usually have a lapping along here. In my case, I usually use uh, a, sil a combination of silver and silk. It's a, it's a thread with a core of silk with very fine silver wire wrapped around it. And then all that is wrapped around the, wrapped around the bow. And the silk is, a, is another interesting part of the, the bow. Uh, there's a lot of animals, as you gather, that go into the making of a bow. And the silkworm is a very important contributor and the silkworm is a very interesting little character in, it, in itself in terms of how carefully they have to be looked after when they're, being, when they're being reared. Most of the silk that's around comes from China and they have to be reared in very strict conditions. They're very sensitive to any sort of disturbance, radical changes in temperature, noise. They're very tricky little critters. Um, another interesting material we see on most bows is this little piece on the, the base of the head, which serves to support and bind the head. It, in the past, was usually made of elephant ivory. These days, it's mostly made of mammoth ivory. And this is another e extraordinary material, really. The, the woolly mammoth has been extinct for perhaps 10,000 years or so. So a lot of the ivory that you see on being used in bows today is at least 10,000 years old, or potentially a lot older. Um, it's quite a privilege, really, to be able to use these sorts of beautiful materials. Uh, another thing, occasionally, instead of ebony, you'll see ivory in the, in the frog, rather than ebony. Other materials are used, such as tortoise shell, um, but ivory is, uh, you'll see ivory reasonably frequently. This is a bow that has ivory and gold rather than ebony and silver. i put that there for the moment. So then I can take you through um, the process of making a bow. And a bow always starts, well, the method of bow making that I learned was a, is a traditional French method. So as you've heard in relation to Francois Xavier Tourte, he, um, because he brought the bow to the, the fullness of its evolution, the, the, the French were pretty much ahead of everybody else when it, when it came to bow making. And they developed a, a really beautiful, um, very practical, very efficient method of, of making bows with hand tools. And that method of making and that tradition has been, has been passed down over the, over the years. And many of us who are making bows today can, can trace our lineage of, of teachers right back to bow makers in the um, late 1700s, early 1800s. And it's a, it's a lovely connection to, to have back through, back through time. And very little has changed in terms of method. And probably any one of those bow makers from all those years ago could step into a a modern workshop, um, a workshop of somebody uh, making bows in that French tradition, and they'd probably be able to sit down and, and make a bow. Not an awful lot would have changed. We have electricity, of course, they wouldn't have had that, but pretty much everything is largely the same. It's, it's very much a hand a process that involves hand tools. Um, we use a very simple lathe for things like cutting out the, the eyes in the side of the frog, for shaping the screw that that attach us to this button that goes into the, the stick. They would have used lathes as well, but probably foot operated rather than electricity operated. Um, so we always start with the, with the frog. It just starts as, well, initially a log of ebony, 
split into split into pieces. So we start with a with a lump of ebony, and carve that um, that that shape with files and chisels and knives. Um, it's opened up inside so that you can put hair in there. Uh, it's brought to more or less a finished state. And then we start working on the button, which starts off as, again, just a little piece of ebony and a couple of sheets of silver that are bent into rings, soldered, fitted onto each end of the, the ebony piece and shaped on the lathe. And then that's left aside and we start working on the, the stick. And the stick is, is roughed out, brought to a, it starts as a, as a plank of wood, really, and it's cut into a, a, a vaguely stick-shaped thing. And then with uh, planes, a series of planes, it's, it's, it's reduced in size, it's made octagonal. This curve is, is bent into it, and that's a very important part of the, the process, that curve, or the camber, as we call it is really responsible, along with the dimensions used along the stick, for how well that, that bow will, will play. So the shape of that curve has an enormous bearing on how that bow feels and how it, how it performs. And musicians are incredibly sensitive to slight changes in camber. A little bit too much camber in one area or a little bit too little, and musicians will notice it and they can, they can tell you we can play a bow and tell you exactly where something feels funny, and invariably there'll be, there'll be something there, a little too much camber, not quite enough, a little bend to one side or the other. So that, it's very important that that camber be very consistent. It's a very even curve from one end right to the other. Um, then once the stick is brought to a certain dimension and this camber is put in, we go back to the, to, to the frog and the button, and all three things are then worked together to, uh, to bring the bow to its the, the sort of thing you see, you see here. One of the very last things we do actually is put the hair in. Oh, I must talk to you about the hair, I forgot to talk about that a while ago. The hair goes in, the bow is varnished, the, the lapping and thumb grip are put on, final adjustments are made to camber and straightness of the, the stick. And the bow leaves the workshop and sets out on its, on its life with a musician and hopefully provides service for a very long time. Uh, I'll come back to the hair, though. The hair is a very interesting part of the bow, a very important part, obviously. Um, hair comes from... There's a myth I'd like to explode here about hair, actually. Uh, hair comes from, these days, mostly from Canada, Siberia, Mongolia. And it has often been thought that the reason hair comes from these places is that cold climates produce strong, tough horse hair, which has a certain logic to it, and, and I believed this for many years myself. I discovered recently, talking to the guy who provides me with, with horse hair, he's in Yorkshire in England, it's, it's actually simply a question of availability. So th this guy who supplies me with hair, he's... He's been in the hair trade for about 50 years or so. And when he, was, when he started out, hair was readily available in the UK and Ireland, where I'm from. Um, but of course, we don't use the horse so much as, as we used to, so, so we just don't have availability anymore. In a place like Mongolia, um, in Mongolia, the horse is a hugely important part of, of their world, really. The horse is transport, it's a work animal and it's a, a staple part of their diet. So the horse hair, in a set, the, the hair that we use is, is almost slightly a, a byproduct of, um, of the, the abattoirs, really. And interestingly, over there, when they slaughter horses, every single part of the animal is used. Uh, the bones, the hooves, everything, the mane hair, the tail hair, the, even the body hair is, is, is sold for making little small brushes from. And the hair itself um, has an interesting journey then. It has to go from Mongolia to China, where there are a lot of people there very experienced in dressing hair, as we call it. For me, that's really what a hairdresser is, uh, rather than somebody in a salon. It's somebody who can deal with this stuff for me. So they put the hair through a process of sorting and, 
several stages of cleaning, and eventually it goes to Yorkshire, to my supplier, and there it goes through further sorting, further cleaning, and eventually uh, makes its way across the Irish Sea to me. Um, what else was I going to say about the hair? Oh yeah, I wanted to say that one of the things I learned recently in the course of, well, a friend of mine made a radio documentary recently on, specifically on the materials that go into a bow. And if any of you are interested in, in um, having a link to that, if you want to listen to it, ask me afterwards and I'll, I'll tell you where you can find it online. But one of the fascinating things we discovered was that for one bow to be rehaired, uh, potentially up to 30 horses have to have to die effectively from any one tail. If you imagine a tail of a horse that's maybe this long, well, only a certain amount of it is that long. Some of it's that long, some of it's that long, some of it's that long, some of it's that long. So by the time you take out hair of a usable length, your own, and, uh, and then that's sorted in terms of quality, you're only left with about five to 10 hairs of any one tail that, that can be used. So um, I, was, I was staggered when I heard that, and I see it, uh, I tend to see it now as a, as, a, as a precious material in much in the way that I look at some of the other stuff in the bow. So, then there are, one thing to mention, there are, there are certain differences between violin bows, viola bows, and cello bows. You'll see slightly different shapes the violin bow and viola bow are very similar, exactly the same length, um, but bigger in every other respect, a little wider in the head, a little higher in the head, wider in the frog, higher in the frog. The button is a little bigger. It weighs about 10 grams more than a, than a violin bow. Then we come to the cello bow, which is shorter, a violin bow. From the end of the stick to the other end of the stick, it's 730 millimeters. A viola bow is the same, a cello bow is 700 millimetres, but also much bigger in every respect, a much thicker stick, bigger frog, taller frog, wider frog, wider head, taller head, um, and that is about 20 grams heavier than, uh, than a violin bow. Uh, other than that, the approach, the approach to, to making, making bows is, is the same. And then another thing to mention in terms of making is that, is that bows are generally, they're, they're tailored to a specific individual's needs. So if somebody asks for a, a bow to be made, I want to know what they like and don't like in a bow. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of scope for making a bow specifically for one individual and something that will work with their particular instrument. Pernambuco varies a lot. So people can ask for certain weights of bow, and they can be very specific. They could say to me, well, I want a bow that weighs 61 grams or 61 and a half grams. They might want a dark sound. They might want a brighter sound. They might want balance. They might want different kinds of balance. They might want it to feel a little heavier towards the head. They might want it to feel a little heavier towards the, the frog. Um, there's a lot of scope. They might want it to be very strong. They might want it to be quite flexible. So there's a, there's, a, there's a huge amount that can, that can vary, even with, with um, one piece of wood. It can effectively be many different kinds of bow, depending on how that, that, that camber is constructed and how much camber is in, is in the bow. Pernambuco varies a lot in terms of density as well, so you can, you can, you can tailor a bow to provide the sort of sound that somebody is actually looking for. So a dark instrument could be made to brighten up a bit, um, or conversely, a bright sounding instrument could be made a little darker if that's what's required. So it's a very, um, it's a, a bow is a very personal, very personal thing. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a, it's a constant challenge really for, for me to be, uh, to try to always produce what an individual person is, is actually looking for. Um, so I have very little else to say, actually. We probably do have time for a few questions, actually, if anyone would like to ask some questions. Yes, hi. Isn't the wood supply in South America diminishing? 
there there are there are problems with with Pernambuco. It's the, the trade in it is restricted, um, so they're not they're not allowed to ex export Pernambuco from Brazil now in its raw form. Um, but there there is there is a lot of great work being done in terms of replanting. At the moment, there's an, org an, org an organization called the IPCI, International Pernambuco Conservation Initiative. They work closely with the Brazilian government, and there's a huge amount of replanting going on, and the, the picture looks very good, so it, it should hopefully guarantee a good supply of Pernambuco into the future. And there are a lot of stocks of Pernambuco um, in places around the world, then I've never gone directly to Brazil for Pernambuco. I've tended to buy it from wood dealers in, in the United States. But um, yes, hopefully uh, it, it, it has been problematic, and hopefully it'll be it'll be fine into the, the future. Let's hope so. Yes. Uh, how is the Sorry. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you. I, I should have explained that. When you take off this, I don't know how well you can see this here, when you take off this silver ferrule here, this, what we call the, the slide, this piece of shell comes out, and inside you have a, you have a hole that goes down into the, into the frog, and the hair is just, the hair goes, goes in here through the, the ferrule, under the slide, down into a hole, and then it's held in place with a, a simple wooden wedge, a tight-fitting wedge, a very important wedge. Um, and it's the same here, you have a, you have a hole in the, in the head here. At an angle like this in the front, the front of the wedge has a corresponding angle, so the hair comes along over the wedge and under the wedge. It, it tends to want to pull the wedge out, but because you have a sloping front up against a, a, a sloping front of the, the mortise, it, it can't come out. So that, that wedge here and the wedge in here are very important parts of the, of the thing, really. The, the last thing anyone wants to see is somebody on stage playing a bow and a wedge come flying out and hair scatter everywhere. So those wedges are important. Mm. Yes? Well, the, well we, don't, we don't use elephant ivory anymore. But mammoth ivory is, is, is a perfectly legal thing to, to use. There's, there's, no, there's no restriction on that. Um, it's been extinct for a very long time. Um, it, actually, I meant to say about that, that mammoth ivory, most of my mammoth ivory comes from Alaska. It comes from places like Alaska, Canada, Siberia. And there seems to be an extraordinary amount of it buried in the, in the tundra there. Um, hmm. Tortoise shell? Um, it's very rarely used these days. Again, you, it's illegal to use it un unless, as with elephant ivory actually, unless you find a piece of ivory accompanied by a certificate to say that it's been around since before there was a ban in place. So it, it can be legally used, but it's, uh, it's very rare these days. Yeah. Mm. Hi. Sorry, I haven't quite, I, I can't quite hear you. Yeah, that's right, and, and anecdotally I've heard stories of, of bows being destroyed. Um, because uh, even because of tip plates, because they think it's it's elephant ivory, even when it's not. So that 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 is a, that is a real problem. Um, and some states in America have have even outlawed the use of mammoth ivory. And those that haven't have outlawed the use of um, even the possession of of small amounts of ivory in a of elephant ivory in a bow. So it is problematic, and people are advised to travel with certificates if 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 possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. How do you even the tension on the individual hairs? Right. The, the hair, pu putting the hair into um, the bow is, is, is a reasonably delicate uh, process. It's, it's, it's put in at one end and uh, fixed in there. 
and then it's, the bow is put in a vise, and the hair is very carefully combed, tied off at the other end, and put into the stick. And part of, that, part of the handling of the hair in that process is what de determines how even it will be across the, across the hank of hair. And that's, that's a fault you, you, you don't want to see in a, in a bow when it's rehaired. You don't want a situation where there's slightly more tension on one side of the, the hank of hair than, than on the other side. That's important. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Hello. How many hours of work roughly would there be in begging an individually commissioned person? Approximately 60. For me, approximately 60 hours. Some people would be faster than me, some would be slower than me. Yeah, approximately that. And then when you're making something like ivory and, and gold, it's, it's, using gold is slower, using ivory is slower, mammoth ivory. Um, that would probably bring it up to potentially up to about 80 hours, actually. Yeah, so it can be time consuming. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Right. Uh, double bass players like black hair. Sometimes it gives extra grip, but I use almost entirely white hair. So we've pretty much run out of time. So I'd like to thank you all very much for coming and uh, see some of you around over the course of the day, no doubt. Thank you. Thank you.